Okay, so I want to welcome you to our uh, fir my first online video commentary series. I hope to do a lot of these, but uh, I'm I'm really excited about this. Uh, I've had a vision for a long time to um, do commentaries because one of the things that has helped me tremendously is to find a really good, easy-to-read commentary that really gets the heart of what a particular book in the Bible is. And for me to go in there and study it and read through it and things like that, and, and then to go back to the commentary to find out, okay, here's some historical background or some context I didn't understand or here's some dates or whatever I didn't understand. And it, it's helped me tremendously to grow in my understanding of the Lord, of the Word of God, and things like that. And so, you know, I look at the church today and, and there's really a lot of, of Christians, sadly, that are not even, they don't read the Bible anymore. They don't study the word of God anymore. You, you can see it when, when, teach, when teachings are out there floating around. It's out, verses are taken out of context to try to prove a certain point. And what I found is if I go back to the Word of God, if I go back to the Scriptures, if I go back to the original context of, you know, when, who wrote this book and why did they write it and what, who were they writing to and what was the purpose of it, and I go through verse by verse to, to study it and get it, it, it changes me, it transforms me. And so that's been one of the greatest things that has equipped me uh, as a minister, as a, as a believer, is to get back to the scriptures and go into that. And so I'm happy that we're the first one we're going to do. The first video commentary we're going to do is about the book of Galatians. The book of Galatians is a powerful book. It is a powerful book. I don't know if you realize this or not, but Galatians was, many scholars believe this, and I believe this as well, that Galatians was the first New Testament book written. And in the book of Galatians, what, what I love about the book of Galatians is Paul takes this book and he uses it like a hammer to demolish legalism. And as we, you'll see it very clear as we get into this. I mean, Paul, chapter after chapter, verse after verse, is just taking the hammer of God's word and he's smashing to pieces the legalistic approach to God that... that that has been so prevalent throughout the ages and was prevalent or prevalent for many, many years, hundreds of years, thousands of years even, that, that you've got to obey these commandments in order to be right with God. And Paul says that will cut you off from the grace of God. And so we're going to dive deep into the book of Galatians. And uh, I just, you know, one of the ways that I want to encourage you in terms of how to approach this is is go to the book of Galatians, read a chapter, listen to the video commentary. Um, there's also notes that will be used. You can read those as well. And, and take those and then read them, get them. And then after you've read a chapter, read it, listen to it, and then go back to that chapter and read it again. And, and the goal is to get this in your heart. That, that's really what we're after here, is to get the word in your heart. And the Lord told a parable, he said in uh, the parable of the sower, that some of the people that heard the word of God, they fell away because they did not plant the word for themselves in their heart. They heard the message, they read the, the book, they heard the teaching, they went to the conference, they did this, they did that, but they didn't take the effort and the time to get the word of God and plant it in their own heart, and so they fell away. And so I, that's one of the, another one of my reasons for wanting to do this, I want to, get, I want to get believers into the Word of God, and I want to see them planted, the plant the Word of God into their heart. So as we go through any, any scripture study, any scripture reading or whatever, there's, there's three things we want to consider. The, the first one is revelation, is the, what was revealed, what was revealed to Paul in the book of Galatians. What did God unfold to him? What is the revelation Paul received? And the second thing we want to consider is interpretation. Um, who was Paul writing to? Who were these people he was writing to? What was the reason and the motive for him writing? And what was the historical context? What was the historical background? What are some things we have to know to be able to make sense of what Paul was saying? We want to look at it verse by verse, chapter by chapter. We want to understand how it fits into the full narrative of Scripture. 
And as you do all these things, it helps you to understand how to interpret what Paul, by the Holy Spirit, was trying to communicate and trying to survey. And then finally, we want to take the revelation and take the interpretation, and then we want to make an application to us. For example, Paul is writing to a particular group of churches in Galatia who had heard the gospel, received the gospel, had seen a move of the Holy Spirit, had experienced a great revival, but then Judaizers from Jerusalem come and tell them, hey, if you really want to be right with God, it's, it's not only faith in Jesus Christ, it's also works. You must obey the law. And so, you know, Paul is addressing specifically them, but we want to take that and say, okay, living in the 21st century, how can we take the revelation and the interpretation of these scriptures and apply them to our life so that we can um, grow in the Lord and understand the Bible and grow closer to Him? So that's really the, the pattern we're going to follow as we go through this study. Um, the, the next thing I want to talk about is just the flow of, of a timeline in terms of events that sets the context for the book of Galatians. And this, this uh, flow I'm going to describe is going to be, a, I'll have a picture of it for you in the notes, but th this really began in about Acts chapter 9. Paul, or Saul of Tarsus, is on his way to Damascus. He's going to destroy churches. He's going to arrest Christians. He's going to persecute them. In fact, it says that Paul was going about ravaging the church. Saul, or, or not even Saul, Paul, but, uh, his Saul of Tarsus, before he changes his name to Paul, is going about ravaging the church. He's going house to house. He's going to persecute them. He's going to just take them and bring them into prison and all this. And, all, and he, you know the story, but all of a sudden, Acts chapter 9, the sun of God, shining like the sun, shines down upon Saul of Tarsus as he's on his horse leading to, heading to Damascus. And all of a sudden, Saul of Tarsus is knocked to the ground, and he hears the Lord speak to him in that, that blinding sunlight. And he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And, and Saul has the most dramatic conversion probably in history. You know, this, this man who was trying to kill God's people. He was trying to destroy the church. He was doing everything out of, out of his zeal and for the law and Judaism and all that, that was involved. And he, he meets Jesus Christ face to face. The light of the sunlight of God breaks into him and knocks him down and speaks to him and says, I'm, gonna, I'm going to use you as my choice vessel, as a messenger to the Gentiles. And that's in Acts chapter 9. So he goes from Jerusalem to Damascus, Syria, where he's converted. He stays there just a few days, and we don't know exactly how long it was, but Ananias receives in a vision, and the Lord tells him, hey, I want you to go and pray for Saul of, Saul of Tarsus. And he's like, Lord, are you crazy? Are you crazy? You want me to go and pray for him? He's going to kill me. He's, do you know what he's up to? And the Lord says, he is my chosen instrument. And so Ananias goes, and he prays for Saul of Tarsus, and the instantly, after three days, scales fall from his eyes, and, and Saul can see. And then Ananias prays for him to be, to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And how would you like that, to have that on your resume, as I'm the one that prayed for Saul of Tarsus to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? And so then, after that, Saul goes away for about three years to Arabia. And uh, we'll get into this in a little bit, and a little bit later in one of the later sessions. But he goes to Arabia for three years, the wilderness in Arabia, and, he, and the revelation of God. He experienced the revelation of Jesus Christ externally, but in Arabia, he experienced the revelation of Jesus Christ internally. And in Arabia is where his gospel message is given to him. God takes him to Arabia. God takes him to the wilderness in this place of solitude and, and confinement in this wilderness experience. And the Lord reveals Jesus Christ to Saul of Tarsus. And we're just going to start calling him Paul. And then Paul then goes back to Damascus. We see this in, in Galatians chapter 1, verse 17 through 19. And then, so, so Paul is in Damascus. And then he goes just for about 15 days. And he goes and visits Peter in Jerusalem. Then he goes back. To, uh, then he goes back to Antioch, or yeah, Antioch, 
And then in Acts chapter 11, we see, and this is described in Acts chapter 11, 27 through 30, and Galatians chapter 2, 1 through 10, um, Paul and Barnabas and Titus go to Jerusalem, and he describes this in Acts chapter 2. They go to Jerusalem because a, a prophetic word has come that famine is coming on the whole earth, and they go to Jerusalem to take up, they took up an offering, and they take that offering, and they go to the Jerusalem church to help them when that comes. So then Paul goes back to Antioch, and he's in the church of Antioch, and then we see in Acts chapter 13, the Holy Spirit sets apart Paul and Barnabas for the work that he's called them to, and they are commissioned to go out in Acts chapter 13. <clears throat> and so Paul goes on his first missionary journey in Acts chapter 13 and 14, and this is about the year A.D. 47 and through 48. And so Paul, on this first missionary journey, he plants four churches. And these four churches, as you can read in, in those chapters in Acts, are Pisidian Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. So, so Paul plants these four Galatian churches. And then after this missionary journey, Paul goes back to Antioch. And then Paul is in Antioch recovering from the missionary trip. And then Peter comes, and, you know, Peter is... Peter obviously is all fully on board with Gentiles coming into the church. And he, you know, the Lord had dealt with him in that in Acts chapter 9 and Acts chapter 10, where he had the vision and the sheet comes down and the Lord says, don't call unclean what I call clean. And the Lord commissioned him to go to the Gentiles and the Holy Spirit falls upon Cornelius and his whole household. They get baptized in the Holy Spirit and they... And the Lord, the Lord is basically saying, this, this thing is not just for Jews, it is for Gentiles, it is for everybody. So Peter is fully on board with the gospel going to the Gentiles, and Peter is eating with the uh, Gentiles in Antioch, and you know he's eating, having table fellowship. Well, all of a sudden, some Judaizers come from James, not that James sent them, but they have a, a letter supposedly from James commending them that these are good guys, and they start talking to Peter, and they're saying, why you being a Jew are having table fellowship with these unclean Gentiles? Don't you know what it talks about in the law? Don't you know what the law says about this? That, you know, you, you, you're going to defile yourself. You're going to ruin your testimony before the Lord. And so Paul goes through and talks about this. Peter was carried away by this, and even Barnabas was carried away. So they began to have, to se to, uh, have separate meals together. And when, when Paul hears about this, <clears throat> he's irate. When Paul hears about this, he is just irate, and he even calls out Peter. And this is crazy. He calls out Peter, the, the water walker, the, the one whose shadow is healing everybody. I mean, he's the most, Peter's the most famous person in the church at that time. And Paul calls him out, and he says, how in the world can you do this? God, God even gave you the vision. You know, how can you say that these people are unclean? You're being hypocritical. You're being two-faced. And he calls them out in front of everybody. And, you know, Peter is, I'm sure, humiliated by that because Peter was in the wrong there. So then uh, what, happens, what happens is there's Judaizers. And Judaizers, just to help you understand what a Judaizer is, a Judaizer is someone who believes in Jesus Christ and believes in the finished work of the cross. A Judaizer is someone who says, okay, yes, the finished work of the cross is enough, or the finished work of the cross, you got to put faith in Jesus Christ. Yes, I agree with that. But you also have to keep the law of Moses in order to be saved. You can see that in Acts chapter 15, verse 1, is that unless you are circumcised and you obey the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, again, the Judaizers believed Jesus was the Messiah, but they didn't believe that faith alone was what saved you. They believed that you had to do the works of the law to be right with God. And so the Judaizers hear about um, Paul's missionary journey to Galatia, and the Judaizers, they send, led by one person, they go and they send a group of people to Galatia the Judaizers, and they, they begin to disturb. That's what Paul says. Paul uses the language. They begin to disturb the Galatians. They begin to, even he uses the phrase, bewitch them. He says, who has bewitched you? 
I mean, you know, who has brought you? Who has disturbed you? Who has disrupted? I mean, we had a revival. We had a, a move of God. The, the Holy Spirit was poured out. He was doing signs and wonders. You were born again. The Spirit of God came upon you, and he came inside of you. Who has disturbed you? Who is this that's doing that? You're under a curse of witchcraft right now. You have been severed from Christ. Who are the ones doing it? It was the Judaizers that did not like Paul's gospel of grace apart from works of the law. And so the Judaizers disturbed the Galatians, and the Galatians are just completely confused because they're like, Paul, you taught us all these things about faith and justification and grace and, and how we get right with God and all these different things. And now these guys are saying, no, Paul, this guy Paul, who is he? He's not even anyone of any reputation. He's not one of the 12. He's not even from Jerusalem. He's from Antioch. It's like, who is this guy? He has no authority. He has no revelation. He has no place to do any of that. And so the Galatians are in this utter state of confusion because they are beginning to now say, if I want to be right with God, I have to keep the, the 613 commandments in the law of Moses. And so Paul goes and he writes the book of Galatians in 49 AD specifically to correct the teaching of the Judaizers. And this is the, uh, the first New Testament book that's written is the book of Galatians. And Paul lays a hammer to legalism. He just says that this message of legalism, we're going to just destroy this message because this is not how you get right with God. And so the book of Galatians, there, there's no other book in Scripture, in my opinion, that deals with legalism quite the way Paul does in the book of Galatians. And so that's the context there. And then the last thing I would say in the timeline is in Acts chapter 15 is one year or so after he writes Galatians, they go to the Jerusalem council where Paul and Barnabas meet with James and John and Peter, and they come together in agreement and say, yes, Paul, you are, you are sent to the Gentiles. The Gentiles do not need to obey the law of Moses to be saved. And they have the, the first church council is established to say the Gentiles, that faith in Jesus Christ is what saves you. So that's how that, that timeline flows there. So the, um, the other thing, a couple other things just to mention as we understand the, the book of Galatians is when, when Paul went, went to the Galatians and when he on his missionary trip, he was sick. So he had some kind of a sickness, and some people think it was some kind of an eye sickness because he said that if you would have, if you would, you were, you received me like an angel, you received me like Jesus Christ Himself, you would even even plucked out your eye if you could have. And so some people think that he had some kind of an eye issue on this missionary journey. But he talks about that in Galatians chapter four, verse thirteen through fifteen. But you know, the Galatians, just to give you an understanding, the Galatians are full-blown heathens. They have never been under the law. They worship idols, false gods. They, they basically are worshiping demons. They practice sexual immorality. They're, they're, they're superstitious. They're practicing witchcraft. I mean, all, just completely pagans, and they get saved, and they are born again, not by the works of the law, but by faith, by the hearing of faith. And so Paul has seen, you know, this great revival go on. And, you know, we, we talked about the Judaizers. But in terms of understanding, I, I thought this was such a great point. F.F. F. Bruce, he's a late British scholar, talked about mirror reading. And he said, this is what he said, is if we, if we want to understand the New Testament, he said, we are in a position of people listening to one end of a telephone conversation. We have to infer what is being said at the other end in order to reconstruct the situation for ourselves. It's mirror reading. It's basically saying, okay, you can look at what Paul says and his, his rebuttal and his arguments, his tone and things like that, and you can say, okay, on the other end of that conversation, this must have been happening. This is mu what have, must have been said. And so using mirror reading, we can understand a couple things about the book of Galatians is Number one is the Judaizers are telling Paul, you're an illeg or he's saying about Paul to discredit the message. They want to discredit the messenger. And they're saying that Paul is an illegitimate minister because he's not part of the 12 and he's not from Jerusalem. And Galatians 1.1, Paul's refuting that. Uh, they also say Paul is a man pleaser. 
Paul just wants to tell you what you want to hear. He's not, I mean, the, if he really preached the law, you would, you would not like what he said. So Paul is watering down the gospel to, to make it more a, appealing to you so you can come and, and receive it. And, and uh, the other thing they said is Paul is only a disciple of the 12. He doesn't have legitimate authority. He doesn't have direct revelation. The 12 had direct revelation from Jesus Christ. They walked with him for three and a half years. You know, they, they saw his death and resurrection and ascension to heaven. They are the ones with authority. This Paul guy that you've been listening to has no authority and no revelation, and he has no commissioning from God. And so you can understand when Paul writes Galatians, he has a, a certain tone about him. He has a certain you know, feel you can, you can discern through it. And Paul is, you, you, you can sense he's, he's frustrated, he's perplexed, he's even angry at the Galatians who he says, you're my children, you're my children, you know, what are you doing? You know, if you've ever had to correct your kids, but they do something stupid, you know, Paul is like, my children, what are you doing? This is, are you thinking right now? And, you know, Paul is defensive. He's, 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 he's got to actually build up his, his resume so they can receive his message. So Paul spends quite a time, quite a bit of time defending the legitimacy of his ministry. Um, he goes through, and we'll, we'll go through this in detail. He goes through and he says, you know, my ministry came by direct revelation from Jesus Christ. I did not receive this gospel from the 12 in Jerusalem. I received it from no man but Jesus Christ. He revealed it to me himself. And so, he, you know, he goes through that, and, and, and we'll, we'll get into that in, in, in more detail. But he, he tells them, he says, listen, after I was saved, after I went into Arabia for three years, after, the, after Jesus gave me direct revelation himself, he says, it was 14 years before I went to the apostles in Jerusalem to verify that my gospel was truly from the Lord. So he's like, to the Galatians, what, you're, what these Judaizers are saying about me to discredit my message of grace is absolutely false. Is I received this from, directly from the Lord himself. So the main theme of Galatians, and we, we mentioned this, is, is, is Galatians is the greatest defense against legalism in Scripture. It's not Christ plus something else. It's not Christ plus obedience. It's not Christ plus prayer. It's not Christ plus fasting. It's not Christ plus evangelism. It's not Christ plus anything. It is by faith, through grace, and the finished work of Jesus Christ alone. And Paul is hammering this fact to the Galatians. Is, and, and I just want to say, if you struggle with legalism, if you struggle with, you know, you don't feel like God has accepted you, you feel like you've got to do a bunch of works, you've got to do a bunch of things for God to like you, and that you don't feel his acceptance or his love unless you obey, you know, I'm not, and I'm not saying don't, I'm not saying to disobey by any means, but I'm saying, but you've got to do every single thing on the checklist, and then if you do all that, then maybe God likes you. This book will help you set you free from just the bondage of legalism, of trying to perform for God based on some kind of ritual, you know, that, that, that we have to do certain things for him to accept us, and we have to obey in our own power for us to be sanctified and holy. And the, the, the Galatians comes and says, no, that is not true. Legalism, you know, trying to get right with God by, by obedience and trying to get right with God uh, through uh, stringent uh, obedience to commandments and trying to live a holy life in our own power. He's, Paul's like saying, no, 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 that's not what this thing's about. It is about faith in Jesus Christ and in his finished work. It is about receiving the indwelling Holy Spirit. And it's about the Spirit of God in you living instead of yourself. Then you begin to obey and then you can experience true sanctification. So that's really the, the theme of, of Galatians. And, and you can see in Galatians 2.20, it's, it's one of my favorite scriptures that Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, not I, but Jesus Christ lives in me. And the life I live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the gospel right there. That is what it's all about, living by the power of the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. 
is, and no, and that's really what it's all about, is, is we have died. We died to the law. We died to sin. We died to self. We died in the body of Jesus Christ so that the Spirit of God would come to dwell inside of us and that Him living inside of us would live rather than us. And Paul says, this is what it's all about. This is the way I live. And then he goes through in uh, chapter 4, and he says, okay, you had a good start. You, you're justified by faith. You were justified by the hearing of faith and not by the works of the law. But he said there came a problem when you began to, to uh, abandon those principles, and you began to say, okay, now that I'm okay with God, if I really want to be right, if I really want to be holy, then I've got to do all these other things. And Paul's like, no, you know, he said, are you trying to be perfected by the flesh? Are you trying, you know, you started well, but are you trying to be perfected by the flesh? That's, that's ridiculous. You know, he who began a good work in you will do it himself through you. And that's what he's arguing for here in the book of Galatians. And then we see in uh, chapter 5, if Paul is saying if, if we walk by the Spirit, meaning if we're led by the Spirit, the Spirit of God dwells inside of us, and we're led by the Spirit of God, then we will bear the fruit of the Spirit, we will overcome the flesh, and then, I love this, then we're not under any law. We are delivered from the law when we are led by the Spirit of God. And, and that's what Paul's driving at. So that's a, that's a quick background and overview of, of the book of Galatians. The one thing I want to take just a, a few minutes, probably 10, 10 to 15 minutes or so, is I want to go through and talk about the law just for a minute because a lot of us as Christians, we don't know anything about the law. And you know what? Paul uses in the book of Galatians, Paul uses the word law 32 times in 25 verses. That's, that is significant. In fact, of all the verses in Galatians, he uses the word law. 17% of the verses, he uses the word law. And I would say, just reading through the book of Galatians, is so many of the chapters, are almost every one of them, are in some way or another, are about the law, or about the law, about the law. And what I've found as, as Gentile Christians, we don't really know much at all about the law. And so I want to spend just a few minutes talking about the law, what it is, how we can understand it, how can we rightly make sense of when Paul uses that term, what he means, because we just come to that and we're like, I don't even, you know, we just, the law, the law of Moses, Ten Commandments, whatever, we don't really know what that means. But, you know, we've, we've got to understand this deeply. And so I want to just take about a few minutes and talk about that. The, uh, a summary uh, of the law, just real quick, a summary of the law. The law was the main document of Israel's national covenant from God. So it was the main, it was the main um, document it was the, of, of God's covenant with Israel, with the nation of Israel. And so you can view the law as the constitution of ancient Israel. And so the law was basically took... Um, took the moral law, which is for everyone and is universal, and took the moral law and put that into one document with all of the different things like the civil law and the ceremonial law and the dietary laws for how ancient Israel was to live. And so it, it, just in summary, the law both reflects God's universal and internal moral standards and it relates specifically to Israel's calling as a nation and its identity. And so here's an easy way that I've found to really break down the law. And, and I've, I've said it already, but I'll say it again. There were 613 commandments in the law, just a massive number of commandments related to all kinds of different things. And I've found this to be super helpful to kind of break it down is, is the law can really be broken down into four different categories. Number one, the moral law. Number two, the civil law. Number three, the ceremonial law. And then number four, the dietary law. And so scriptures do not really segment the law that way. And so some scholars go, well, you really can't do that because, you know, the, the word of God itself doesn't do that. But I, when I look at it, I'm like, okay, this makes it, for, especially for Gentiles trying to understand, so much easier to understand 
because it helps us break down, okay, this is the moral commandments. These are the ceremonial commandments and things like that. So when Paul mentions the law in the book of Galatians, he's talking about the moral, the civil, the ceremonial, and the dietary laws that were all contained in uh, Genesis, Deuteronomy, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. And so the first five books, I probably didn't even do that in order, but the first five books of Moses um, are the law, and uh, that's what Paul is going to be referencing here in, in Galatians. So let's talk about the moral law just real quick. Is the moral law, when we're all familiar with the Ten Commandments, you know, we're, we're, you know when we're you know, young, babies or whatever, children, we understand, we, we learn about the, the Ten Commandments in, in kindergarten, I, guess, I don't even know when, but we learned about those as kids. You know, the first, and so the, uh, I'm just going to go through this just real quick, but the, the moral law and the Ten Commandments, you see the first and second commandment are against idolatry. The third commandment is against blasphemy. The fifth commandment is against honor, or is, is saying you've got to show honor. The sixth commandment is a, um, a advocating against murder. The seventh, sexual morality. The eighth, stealing. The ninth, honesty. The tenth, coveting. And you know, the Sabbath I'm going to deal with as part of the ceremonial law. But really, the Ten Commandments, here, this is really an important thing to understand. The Ten Commandments are the hub of the law. Because without a central moral law, the civil law has no power. And what I mean by that is the civil law punished people for breaking the moral law. And so if there's no moral law to define the standard, if there's no moral law to define right and wrong, then the civil, the civil law had no power. The ceremonial law, which would cover sins that were breaking the moral law, had no power, had no definition. And so the moral law really was the hub of the entire law that defined what is right and wrong in God's eyes. So this is the way, a, a pattern you see in the law, this, is, this, this really will help you understand it because, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm positive you're not going to go out and read the book of Leviticus <laughs> unless you're having trouble sleeping. But the, the Ten Commandments... The way the Ten Commandments work, they summarize the moral law, and then this, the pattern you see is throughout, or interspersed throughout the first five books of Moses, you see the moral law expounded. Okay, God, for example, the Lord says, you shall not commit adultery. Okay, well, what exactly, that's the summary, that's the summary of it, but you look at it through Exodus numbers, the first five books, and you say, okay, what exactly do you mean by that? And it is... Commandments such as, you know, you cannot consult mediums, you cannot uh, derive a benefit from idols, you cannot prophesy in the name of idols, you cannot listen to one who prophesies in the name of idols, you cannot practice divination or soothsaying, enchanting or sorcery, and any of that, uh, the familiar spirits related to idol worship, you know, the, the, the law forbids all of that, but the, the Ten Commandments summarizes it. And then as you read through the, the, other, the other parts of the law, you see interspersed throughout the, those pages, you see a more detailed explanation of what that really is. And so, you know, that, that's an easy way to understand the law. And you could take the same thing with adultery. You know, Exodus 20, verse 14 says, you shall not commit adultery. Well, what exactly does he mean by adultery? What does he mean by sexual immorality? And he goes through, and the law shows us. It means incest, homosexuality, bestiality, intimate physical contact with someone that's not your spouse, prostitution. And he goes through, and he, and he just throughout the law describes what that summarization actually means in great detail. And so this pattern could be applied to all the Ten Commandments, you know, honor, murder, stealing, uh, bearing false witness, coveting, things like that, is you see that pattern. It's summarized, and then it's described in great detail, interspersed. There, there's not really a flow. Sometimes it'll just, you know, bring out the moral law out of nowhere, and it's just it's summarizing or it's detailing what was summarized in the Ten Commandments. The other thing I want to point out about the, the moral law is that the moral law is eternal and universal. 
The moral law doesn't, didn't just apply to Israel. The moral law applied to everyone, everywhere, for all time. God just took the moral law and put it into the constitution of ancient Israel, as, and it became part of the law of Moses. But the moral law is for everybody. I mean, God forbids uh, adultery for everyone living in the world. God forbids murder to everyone living in the world. Now, how, do you, how can you say that? Well, how, how can you prove it? You look, you look at it in uh, Leviticus 18. You see that pattern where what happened was God told them in Leviticus 18, these nations who are practicing abominations and they're practicing adultery and they're pra practicing all kind of sexual perversion, these nations are being spewed out of the land because they have done these things. So the moral law is universal. The moral law is eternal. The moral law is to be obeyed by everyone everywhere, not just to the Jewish people, not just, just to the ancient nation of Israel. The other thing you understand is you, if you look at it in uh, the New Testament, every, all, nine of the Ten Commandments were carried over into the New Testament. Every, you know, honor, murder, adultery, idolatry, those kind of things were carried over into the New Testament. The only one, the only commandment that was not carried over was keeping the Sabbath. And I'll, I'll talk about that in just a second. But anyway, that's, that's kind of how the moral law works. The moral law was the hub of the entire law that defined what was right and defined what was wrong. The civil law was contained the criminal code of how to uh, punish those who violated the moral law. So, for example, if someone uh, committed adultery, the, the civil law says, okay, stone them to death. If someone murdered, they said, okay, here's how you punish them. That was the civil law. The civil law also had social laws uh, related to pro uh, property, inheritance, family, marriage, divorce, etc. Just a ton of things of how a civilization is to live in ancient Israel. That's what the civil law was all about. So, um, and, and it, it defined how to punish those who broke the moral law. And, and you know, just imagine if, if a Jew living in the 21st century murdered someone, who, you know, a Muslim, and the Jew says, well, I was just following the, the, uh, the law of Moses because the, Moses said if anyone commits idolatry, you are to stone them to death. I mean, that's not going to hold up in an American court system because our civil laws are, based, are not based on the law of Moses. So, you know, the, the civil law was how you punish and how you deal with the moral law when someone breaks those. And so I, I go through this in the, in the notes, but the, uh, the civil law was only related to ancient Israel's national covenant with God and constitution. It was not something that was to be carried into the new covenant. It, is, it was specifically how... You are to, how ancient Israel was to punish when someone broke the moral law. Now, definitely we were to keep the moral law today, but that is, you know, the, the civil law was described how to punish those certain things. Um, and then, you know, I put in those in 135 AD when uh, the Romans came and drove Israel out of the land for 2,000 years, the, the civil law was no longer to be found. The civil law just evaporated in the sands of time. And, and, you know, the civil law was only related to ancient Israel. The third part is the ceremonial law. And this deals with a, a bunch of things related to the tabernacle and the feast and the Sabbath and the purity laws and ceremonial laws and all those things. They're, they're laid out, you know, all throughout Leviticus and especially Leviticus chapter 23, the feast and whether we should keep the Sabbath and things like that. The, the ceremonial laws gave, I mean, just incredible amounts of detail of, of how we are to, or how Israel was to do offerings and temple worship and all that in mind. Um, but, you know, you can read the book of Hebrews and realize, okay, the, you know, he, the writer of Hebrews deals with that and says, okay, the, those things that are part of the ceremonial law, the Mosaic covenant, those things are obsolete. Jesus Christ is the perfect sacrifice. Jesus Christ, his blood, is the blood that cleanses you once and for all. You, don't, you no longer need the blood of bulls and goats, and you no longer need any of that to, to be in right standing with God. The, 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 the ceremonial law, all that stuff, is an obsolete covenant 
that no longer has any place because of the new covenant of Jesus Christ. And then, you know, the other question is, okay, what about the feast or the feast of the Lord, the Passover, Pentecost? You know, we're, we've got Pentecost coming up and, you know, tabernacles are celebrated in the fall. Are Christians, to be right with God, do Christians have to keep the feast? Do Christians have to obey Passover? Do Christians have to obey Pentecost? And, you know, you, you, you'll see it in, in Paul's writing. Paul's basically like, look, all those things are a shadow. The substance is Jesus Christ. The, Christ is the substance of every shadow in the law. You are not in right standing with God if you celebrate Passover, if you celebrate Pentecost, if you celebrate Passover. You are not, or, or uh, tabernacles. You are, you, you know, if you, if you don't celebrate these things, God is not mad at you. God does not reject you. You know, Jesus Christ is the substance of these shadows. Now, obviously, that doesn't mean you can't celebrate it. We're celebrating Pentecost on this Sunday. We're going to be celebrating the fact that the Holy Spirit was poured out. We're celebrating the fact that the law of God was written on our heart. We celebrate Passover because Jesus Christ is the Passover lamb. But celebrating it does not make you in right standing with God. Celebrating it does not make you more holy. Celebrating does not draw you, you know, any closer to the Lord. But it you know, celebrating these things are not bad to do, but there's nothing in terms of being in right standing with God to, that these feasts do. It, it can add a new dimension of depth. You know, when you understand the Passover lamb and what Jesus did for you as the Passover lamb, but it does not justify you or sanctify you. And that's really the, the main thing Paul is going to talk about in Galatians. The dietary laws, and everyone, thank God, is the dietary laws do not apply to us. I love barbecue. I love seafood. I love shrimp. I love lobster. Thank God that we are not under that law. And, and so, you know, a lot of times people are like, okay, why did God say you can't eat shrimp or you can't eat lobster or you can't eat uh, pig or pork or any of that stuff? Here, just to be real simple, here's really the simple thing about it is the law itself. And we're going to see this in, in Galatians. I believe it's in chapter 3 or chapter 4. The law was, one of the main purposes of the law was to set apart the nation of Israel until the Messiah came. See, God wanted to have a remnant. I'm going to talk about this in a lot of detail because it's really important. Is Later, is God wanted to have a remnant, a set apart remnant that would not be defiled, that would not be corrupted, that would not be paganized so that this remnant could bring forth the Messiah, and the dietary laws were part of that. Think about it. You couldn't, you know, if you, under the law, you couldn't just go and, and have a meal with your Gentile friends because you had certain regulations. Everything had to be kosher. You had to prepare it a certain way. It basically eliminated Israel from intermingling with the Gentile, their Gentile neighbors. It kept Israel separate for the purpose of bringing forth the Messiah. And so we are not under the, the dietary laws. Thank God for that. Jesus made that clear in Mark chapter 7, 18 through 23. And I hear a lot of people saying amen to that because, in fact, I might get some barbecue later this weekend just to celebrate that fact. Praise God, we are not under the dietary laws. So anyway, I just want to, I want to bring this introduction here to, uh, to a close and just say, okay, this is the background to the book of Galatians, is the law was given, the moral law, the civil law, the ceremonial law, the dietary law, was given to set apart a, the people of Israel that they could bring forth the Messiah. And again, if, if you, there's a, the notes go into a lot more depth, and, and those are available on our website if you want to go into more detail. But... You know, so just want to encourage you, if you want more depth, you can go there. Otherwise, we're going to bring the introduction to a close, and then we'll move on to session one.